So cross-sectional design is used to describe the magnitude of a condition or a disease. So many times data for this study design are collected using the survey or questionnaires. Like case report, survey, survey is also categorized as observational and descriptive research design. However, the study unit is targeting much bigger population than case studies. Survey is a good way to collect large amount of public health data quickly. And survey grew out of um, social science, such as marketing, economics, or politics, dealing with human behaviors. And because much of public health depends on behaviors, survey became useful tool to measure past and present behaviors in public health research. So um, the main uh, feature of cross-sectional design is that it is descriptive. And so because this is descriptive, it can be useful as a starting point to generate more hypotheses or further um, investigation about the uh, development of disease. And the goals of the cross-sectional design is, um, are to uh, estimate the magnitude of disease or health condition in a defined population by providing the prevalence information. So another goal of cross-sectional study design is to assess the need for health service and to establish countermeasures against the condition to relieve the burden of health care. There are a number of population-based cross-sectional studies on blindness and eye diseases. For example, the Irish Glaucoma Survey in 1993 was a successful cross-sectional study that provided prevalence of glaucoma in people over 50 years old. Um, another cross-sectional study, North London Eye Study in 1998, measured prevalence of serious eye diseases such as cataracts or um, age-related macular degeneration in people over 65 years old. Every year, a number of nonprofit organizations such as uh, WHO or other NGOs uh, publishes annual reports on global and regional estimates of the prevalence of visual impairments and other major blinding eye conditions. Results from such surveys are used to improve the eye care, uh, eye care services or health policy. So in order to understand the epidemiology of visual impairment, we need to use an agreed definition of visual acuity so that we can compare the result between the studies and measure impact more accurately. The WHO categories are based on the visual acuity of the better eye and presenting vision. Pinhole is not used when using this method, and presenting visual acuity provides an understanding of refractive need and is important um, because um, especially for the uh, epidemiological surveys and planning. So WHO um, has agreed on the use of four different levels of visual function as described in the International Classification of Disease 10. So these four levels are mild or no visual impairment, moderate visual impairment, severe visual impairment, and blindness. So each of these four levels um, has a clear criterion based on the visual acuity uh, measurement. So according to um, this classification, moderate visual impairment, uh, moderate and severe visual impairment are grouped under the term low vision, whereas um, the low vision um, is taken together with the blindness, um, and then that represent all visual impairment. So this is the table of visual impairment categories based on the International Classification of a Disease 10th revision by WHO, uh, which I showed you before when I talked about the uh, levels of measurement. So the WHO's four levels of a visual um, function um, are categorized and measured as follows. 
So category zero is mild or no visual impairment. And in this category, vision is equal to or better than six over 18 using a Snellen uh, fraction. And category one is moderate visual impairment um, where the vision is worse than six over 18, but equal to or better than six over 60. And category two is severe visual impairment and in this category, vision is worse than 6 over 60, but equal to or better than 3 over 60. And then the final category, uh, the category 3, is um, blindness. And here the vision is worse than 3 over 60. So it is important to um, remember that visual status categories are based on visual acuity, measuring the better eye. And blindness is also used if the visual field is less than 10 degrees from a point of fixation. In 2010, um, the WHO reported that there were 285 million visually impaired people in the world based on the prevalence figures calculated from cross-sectional studies. So here is one of the visual summaries of global estimation of blindness by different age groups from the same report using their categorization of visual function. So as illustrated here, when the overall prevalence of blindness is broken down by age and blindness, whatever the causes are, affects mainly the older section of population, uh, which are these two groups, right? Um, but then, you know, when it does, uh, it hits the age groups really hard because, you know, until like age 44, um, the prevalence is pretty low. But then after that age group, um, the prevalence of blindness just goes up like whopping 20 times um, in this age group. And it just goes up exponentially. So survey or questionnaires are a quick and easy way to do a cross-sectional study. But the uh, topics ideal for survey are those that can be accurately measured by responses from uh, the respondents, such as past and current health behaviors. However, measuring disease prevalence through survey will be very likely to be biased without proper diagnosis from a trained health professionals. So from that sense, uh, one of the representative example of survey used in the public health is quality of life assessment. So this is a fast growing research area in healthcare using survey design. In old days, uh, most medical decisions are exclusively dominated by the healthcare professionals authority. However, healthcare system now has evolved from a disease based to a patient-centered model that is based on the idea that what healthcare professionals find useful and working does not always go hand in hand with the well-being and the functional capacity of the patients. So what's shown here is a visual functioning questionnaire developed by the National Eye Institute in America that was originally developed to assess patients' quality of life before and after treatment or surgery in the eye care, but it can be used in a broader context. So in conducting cross-sectional study um, using survey, you need to think about who will be your subject for your research. So this process requires a clear consideration of the target population um, the population to which the main results of the study will be extrapolated. For example, if you want to study the distribution of visual impairment in Scotland, then your target population will be the entire population living in Scotland. But, you know, for practical reasons, it would be impossible to include all the population across Scotland. So then you need to identify a suitable source population, for example, you, uh, you might decide to conduct the study in one of the major cities like Glasgow. 
And if this is still too big, then the representative sample needs to be selected from the source population using a sampling scheme that we will talk about shortly. So from this sample, the final study participants will be determined because not everyone in the selected sample will end up participating in the study. Some subjects will refuse to participate despite all reasonable efforts. On the other hand, others will have moved out of the area or even dead at the moment. So um, the final participants are usually a subset of the initial sample who are eligible and willing. So a sampling scheme is a detailed description of what data will be obtained and how this will be done. So here we will briefly talk about three major sampling schemes among others. So first we have a simple random sampling scheme, which is the most basic and straightforward sampling scheme. So this is a method of selecting n a number of samples from a population of size n such that every possible sample of size n has equal chance of being drawn. So, uh, you know, this type of uh, sampling scheme provides the most precise results with the uh, smallest sampling error for a given sample size when other things are equal. And one of the uh, examples study used this, simple, uh, this uh, uh, sampling scheme is the Irish Glaucoma Survey um, that I mentioned previously in 1993. Um, they actually successfully applied uh, this sampling scheme to measure the prevalence of glaucoma in the older population. So um, here is kind of a, a cartoon illustration how simple random sampling is done. So here we have a group of 30. Um, so that is our size of population. And we want to select random sample of 15. So here um, it is assumed that each individual have an equal chance of being selected. So before we select the, uh, the sample, uh, we're going to assign whole numbers in sequence to each member. So like this. Right, and you draw 15 random numbers from 30 and pick the uh, corresponding members to have uh, the random sample. So hopefully this kind of reminds you of something you've done already, uh, which, uh, so because this is basically, you know, what you did last week to sample your own data um, for the, um, the data analysis task. And next up, we have a stratified random sampling scheme. And in this scheme, the population of n units. So in this scheme, you first divide the population of interest into several mutually exclusive subgroups called strata based on the variables of interest, such as age or gender, which are typically unmodifiable risk factors. So for example, if you want to know the differences in refractive errors of a population um, between the different age groups of say less than 20 years old, 20 to 40 and over 40, then you might want to stratify the population into the corresponding age groups then do the simple random sampling so that relatively equal proportion of each age group can be selected. So again, um, in this cartoon illustration, we will select 15 random samples out of 30. So as you did in the uh, simple random sampling, you're going to assign each individual with a sequence of numbers. But before you do the sampling, you um, want to identify strata um, because you're interested in the gender difference. So um, you want to maintain relatively equal proportion of gender um, 
that is distributed in the population. So in that case, you stratify the population by gender. And in this example, our population is stratified by 10 males and 20 females. And then now you can draw 50% random numbers from each stratum and pick the respective numbers as the number of samples we wanted to sample uh, from the beginning was 50% of the population. Anyway, now you can use uh, the simple random sampling scheme. So that is male and female. And finally, the cluster sampling. So in real world situations, um, you know, simple random sampling is not cost effective, especially when you are carrying out a study based on a large population. For example, to measure refractive errors of um, the Scotland population, and you want to use a um, you know, sample and select it by simple random sampling then uh, the study at the study samples the study participants you have to cover will be randomly dispersed over a quite large area which will be quite costly and expensive so instead you can divide the greater glasgow area into smaller grid and pick n number of uh, geographical areas through simple random sampling then pick the study samples from the chosen area using, again, the simple random sampling. That way, um, you know where your study samples are clustered. And that way, you will be able to save time and resource in collecting data. And there are a number of studies that actually use this cluster sampling, such as a Nepal blindness survey in 1981 or Baltimore eye survey in 1985 um, in America. So in cluster sampling, before you do uh, the sampling, you want to divide the population into several geographical clusters like this uh, as an example, and then you assign each cluster with the sequence of numbers. And you generate n random numbers from the n number of clusters you have. In this case, uh, the big N is 12. And then the small n, in this case, what? One, two, three, four, five. Right, so basically you pick out five random clusters out of 12 clusters. So once the clusters are sampled, then you do not do the further sampling. So uh, you're going to just take the whole population from each cluster. So that's how you do the cluster sampling. So um, here are the good things and bad things about the study design. So among other things, uh, cross-sectional design can provide prevalence information, which is a baseline rate of a disease or diseases within a population which in turn provides valuable information about the current status of a disease or condition in that population. So this type of research is relatively cheap and quick to complete compared to the other epidemiological research design. Now, of course, it is um, you know, more expensive and takes more time compared to the uh, case report. Um, but this is especially so when you have access to routinely collected data from healthcare providers such as NHS or hospitals. So if you do have access to those data, then it is uh, much easier to carry out large-scale cross-sectional study with a minimum cost, which is a major advantage over other forms of epidemiological research design. On the other hand, one of the major drawbacks of this design is that it is not appropriate to test causal relationship between the risk factors and prevalence. Because both exposures and diseases are studied at the same time, the time sequence between risk factors and disease cannot be established, which is known as a temporality. Right? 
So, I mean, we're going to just talk about this later on. And one of the, uh, the major assumption behind the disease occurrence is that the risk factors or the cause always come before the disease in time. So that is, uh, that is a temporality. And you cannot really establish this uh, temporality with cross-sectional design because they are the exposures, the risk factors and diseases are studied at the same time. And finally, cross-sectional study is also um, not adequate to study rare conditions um, because you need to survey a large sample, very large sample to obtain enough cases. And cases of short duration have smaller chance of being detected in a one-time cross-sectional survey than the cases of longer duration because people with short duration um, uh, short, uh, short lived uh, uh, diseases will either recover fast or die fast. So, um, inevitably, chronic diseases are typically overrepresented in a cross sectional survey.